Good evening, dear friends. Blessings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you. We all right, Sandy? Before we begin, turn with me, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 8. Our subject is, of course, these meetings, Jesus and the Old Testament. But tonight, let's look, first of all, at Nehemiah 8, 8. They read from the book of the law of God. That was the scroll of the Torah, the law of Moses. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. When the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity, as it was predicted they would by Isaiah and by Daniel, when they returned, they left something in Babylon, their mother tongue. Now they spoke an etymologically related language called Aramaic, but only older people remembered how to speak Hebrew, and the Levites and people called scribes, or Sophrim, of which Ezra was one. You know, we always think, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. They were the theologians of the ancient world in Israel. But we also have to remember Jesus said, I will send you scribes. I will send you scribes and prophets. And Ezra was one who God sent. So they left their language in Babylon. And the Hebrew scriptures had not been translated. There was no Septuagint into Greek yet. There was no Targumim into Aramaic yet. There was no Syriac. You just had scriptures in a language that very few people could even read. There's only one verse, only one verse in the entirety of God's word, one and one only. God only saw a need to say it once. One verse that speaks to the issue, the subject, the question of translations. And that's Nehemiah 8.8. 8. The priority is on the original meaning of the original language. The closer a translation is to the original meaning of the original language, the better it is. There are good translations and bad ones, but the closer to the original autographs in the original languages, the better it is. God only saw a need to say it one time. It's the only verse that deals centrally with the issue of translations. Now, there's a lot to be said about that subject in its own right, but you have the Bible in front of you, the scripture in front of you. 70% of that scripture is in Hebrew. Less than one-tenth of one percent from the book of Daniel and a few words and things like this and the post-captivity prophets are in Aramaic, but 70% is Hebrew, roughly 30% Greek. Okay, Those are the languages God gave his word in. Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, but overwhelmingly, by far, the largest percentage of scripture was in Hebrew. The priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages. Can we turn, please, to everyone's favorite psalm, Psalm 23, as we look at Jesus in the Old Testament? Tonight, you're going to need a pencil and an eraser, as well as your Bible. A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in the straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That was anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Most translations, the King James and so forth, read something like that. Now let's read what it really says and verse by verse translate the Hebrew into English, word by word. Mizmor le David, Yehoaroi, lo exar, benaot desha, yarbitseni almai, menuchot yenachalini, nafshi yeshoviev, yanchini, bemagale tzedek le ma'an shmo, gam ki elek begeet sal mavet lo irara, ki ata imadi, shiftacha u beshantacha, hema yenachamuni, tarok le fanad shuhan, Neged Sorarai, the Shanta Beshemen Roshi, Kosire Baya, Echto Vechesed Yordi Funi, Kolyame Hayan, Beshavti, Bebet Yehoa, Le Orech Yamim. Mizmor Le David, the Lord says, This is a psalm of David. A single psalm is called a mizmor, a mizmor. Psalms corporately as books, and there are three major books of psalms, are called tehilim, tehilim, the book of praises. A single psalm, Mizmor, books of Psalms, and we have it in English as one book, but in the original Hebrew canon, it's multiple books. Tehilim, same root as Tehilim, Hallelu, Lechalel, to praise. It's the book of praises, the book of praises, it's the scriptural hymn book. Its literary genre is Hebrew poetry. Now, there are other psalms in Scripture not found in the book of Psalms. There are other psalms in Samuel and so forth, and Isaiah, they're not found in the book of Psalms. Not all psalms are in the book of Psalms, or actually, more accurately, books of Psalms, and not all psalms are psalms of David. This, however, is a psalm of David. When you see in Mizmor de David, a psalm of David, there's a reason. There are psalms that were liturgical, used for the high holy days and worship in Jerusalem. There were different kinds of psalms that had different kinds of musical melodies and rhythms. Much can be said about the psalms, but this one is a psalm of David. And it begins like this. Mizmor le David, Yehovah ro'i lo exar. If your Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Cross that out. That's wrong. That's not what it says. That's wrong. First of all, it says Yehovah, Yahweh, is my shepherd. Ro'e, shepherd, same word as pastor in Hebrew. Yahweh is my pastor. Now, this points to the deity of Christ. It's Christological. Turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort, exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, in verse 4, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Notice certain things. A pastor of a church will receive a crown of glory similar to martyrs. Why is that? 
Not every pastor will be martyred the way Jesus was for the sake of the sheep. But every pastor must be willing to be martyred for the sake of the Lord's sheep. As the good shepherd did in John chapter 10. If someone is not willing to die for the Lord's sheep, they do not qualify to the ministry of a pastor. I have to go to Vietnam in a few weeks. I go to places where that can very well be the reality. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. That was a prophecy about Jesus, but they go for the leaders. In the persecution, they go for the leaders. Well, now, when the chief shepherd appears, it doesn't matter if it's a Baptist church in a rural community in the American South like this one. It doesn't matter if it's a mega church. It doesn't matter if it's a house church with 20 people. That doesn't matter. The pastor, the senior pastor, the chief shepherd of every fellowship of believers is Jesus Christ. The pastor you see is the assistant pastor. Our brother is the assistant pastor. The pastor you see is the assistant pastor. Jesus personally is the pastor of every fellowship, every congregation of believers, irrespective of its size. He's the shepherd. Now this points to his deity. It doesn't say the Lord is my shepherd. It says Yahweh, God. Well, let's look at Peter again. He says this. Exercising oversight, the word episcopo, get the word episcopalian or bit, the Greek word for bishop. Epi, the prefix around, episcopo, looking over. Okay. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. You can only be in pastoral ministry by the will of God, not by the will of man. Believe me, there are certain ministries nobody would want. Nobody in their right mind would want to be a pastor. Every Christian has a target on them. Because when you get saved, you become a target of the enemy. He's already got the unsaved. When you become a Christian, you get a target. When you become a pastor, you get two targets. One in the front and one in the back. The devil, the world, and the unsaved will give it to you in the front. People who say they're Christians will give it to you in the back. I wish I was exaggerating. But I'm not. Nobody in their right mind would want that job. The only reason to do it is because the Lord has called you to. According to the will of God. Not for sordid gain. Be careful of people who go into the ministry for a vo vocation or a career or a job. Right now, the Southern Baptists are compromising on the most fundamental of moral issues like homosexuality. And you've got pastors in churches who know it's wrong, but they won't speak up, they won't speak out. They're not watching over the sheep because they're what Jesus called hirelings. They're in the ministry for sordid gain. Their priorities are the building, their pension, superannuation, salary, the position within the movement or denomination. The They're in the ministry for sordid gain. Therefore, they will not look out for the Lord's sheep. That is their motive. They don't have a calling. They have a job. Sometimes it becomes a racket. They're not looking out for the sheep. They're looking out for them. Sorted gain. 
taken to extremes. This is what Ezekiel 34 calls. With force and severity, you have dominated them. Heavy shepherding. Heavy shepherding from Ezekiel 34. The kings of Israel were to be the shepherds of Israel. Heavy shepherding. Who are you to question us? <laughs> they become a clergy class apart from the people. The Greek term for this, we do not know who or what they were, but we know what the word means. The Nicolaitans. Nicolaity. The suppressors, as it were, of the people. Okay? They're a clergy class who put themselves over the people. But look what Peter says. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. <laughs> I'm just another elder, and that by the grace of God. Notice he claims no primacy. The Roman church teaches Peter was the first pope. Peter disagrees. When you look at the first church council in Acts 15, who was presiding, Peter or James? <laughs> and he wasn't the pope either. But if there was a pope, you have a better case for him. The whole Roman system is a pack of lies. Now understand, the Greek word for antichrist, antichristos, means in place of Christ, not just against. Pope says he's the vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christus. You translate that Latin, Vicarius Christus, into Greek. It is Antichristus. Every pope says he's Antichrist. There is a vicar of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who acts vicariously in place of Jesus and his spirit alone. You put a man in that position, you have a spirit of Antichrist. The Roman papacy is an antichrist institution. Nicolaitanism, antichrist, putting themselves in the position of Jesus. This is my church. No, it's not. If it's your church, get out. Or take it and go. Well, let's look. Shepherd the flock of God. It's not your flock. Not for sordid gain. Be careful of people who don't think it is proper to make tents. For years in Israel, I filled prescriptions six days a week. Co-led a congregation one day a week. It was the only thing I knew how to do. Needed a job, had a family, young family, had to work. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with making tents. Be careful of people who will not have a secular job, business, or profession. They expect the ministry to take care of them. Well, we're called to a church is looking for a preacher. How many people come? How big is the offerings and tithes? How much does it pay? <laughs> and that's not the question. Is Jesus calling you to that church? That's the question. Well, God guides, God provides. Now, if a church or a ministry reaches the size where it needs pastor or staff full time, praise God. That happened in the book of Acts chapter 6, didn't it? If the ministry grows to a point where you need somebody or some ones full time, that's good. But be careful of people who are in the ministry because it's a job. If they don't make tents, they should go out and get an honest job. Well, let's look. You do it voluntarily without remuneration. Not under compulsion because God told you to. Not lording it over. No Nicolaitanism. No heavy shepherding. But proving to be examples. Jesus didn't just say what to do. He showed them what to do by doing it himself. Yeah. Scriptural leadership is not just word. It is word and deed. The notion 
do as I say, not as I do, that doesn't work in God's economy. So, we begin now, Mizmor le David. Why David? David is the Old Testament shadow or type of Jesus Christ as king and as good shepherd. Remember we studied it as the type of the king yesterday from Ruth. He's the type of Christ as king and as shepherd. David was a shepherd. Okay. In the Old Testament, when you read Kings and Chronicles, <clears throat> David was the barometer. How good a king a king was, and remember Ezekiel called the kings of Israel and of Judah the shepherds, how good a king, how good a shepherd of the nation they were, was how much like David they were. He walked before the Lord like his father David, or he did not seek the Lord with all his heart like his father David had done. They're always compared to David. Because David is the Old Testament shadow of Christ. How good is the pastor? How Christ-like is he? <laughs> you understand? One is the shadow of the other. Mizmor le David, Yehovah roi. Yahweh is my pastor. Lo etzar. <clears throat> it doesn't say I shall not want. Cross that out. It's not what it says. Lo exar from Hasar in Hebrew. I shall not lack. I shall not lack. Not that I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not lack the things the Lord says I need. The sheep will not lack the things the shepherd knows they need. Who knows what's better for a newborn little baby? A little baby or a pediatrician? Who knows what's better for a newborn calf? The little calf or a veterinarian? Who knows what's better for us? Us or our creator and savior? Babies might want something. But it's no good for them. <laughs> we might want something. But the shepherd knows it's no good for us. I saw one con artist money preacher in this country, this country, and he was saying, look at the widow's might. It says she gave from her want. She gave because she wanted to get something. If that's your motive for giving unto the Lord, don't give. The word faith money preachers love to go by the King James want. But that's not what it says. Now, I'm not against the King James. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying the priority is on the original meaning of the original language. We shall not lack. We are told by the Apostle John, if we ask according to his will. Yes, I just believe the Lord for that Mercedes Benz. Hallelujah. I always wanted a Porsche, Lord. Hallelujah. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Yeah. I want it. And it's mine by faith. It's my birthright as a Christian. Hallelujah. During the millennial reign of Christ, it will actually will be something like that. The meek shall inherit the earth. During the millennial reign of Christ, it will be something like that when he's ruling this place instead of Satan. But greed won't be a factor. Satan will be bound. There will be a difference between desire and lust between desire and greed. 
that that's coming on God's terms, but not on our terms. <laughs> not on terms of fallen man <clears throat> and this world is in the power of the wicked one. We shall not lack what the shepherd knows we need. Now, sheep are not very clever. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 2. Benaot desha yarbitseni, almai menuchot yanachaleni. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Reverend, can you read that again? He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Benaot desha yarbitseni. Where do you get the green? Doesn't say green. There's no green in there. Green is yarok in Hebrew. There's no green. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. No, that's not what it says. He maketh me lie down in pastures. There is a picture of Jesus, a painting, and there's prints of it, and it's a nice looking picture, I guess, of Jesus in a long red frock with a shepherd's <coughs> crook, <coughs> carrying a little lamb surrounded by sheep. Now there is a kind of truth in that, but he's standing with the background of lush green hills and mountains. That is obviously the artist's concept because the artist was probably from Wales or New Zealand or somewhere where they have a lot of sheep farms and a lot of green hills and mountains. That's not what Israel looks like. <laughs> it's rocky hills. It's deserts. It's brush. And the shepherd has to lead the sheep seasonally from oasis to oasis, looking to survive. The most famous oasis in Israel is a place called Ein Gedi. Ein Gedi. You can see Ein Gedi from across the Dead Sea in Jordan. Not that it's that big, but because it's the only green thing around. Strip of green with a brook trickling through it, going up a mountain where there's a water catchment area from the two rainy seasons and the rain is trapped or the rain is, the, the, the water is, there's a catchment, natural catchment area and the water drips down into these two caves with water in them. And from these two caves, this stream goes down and on either side of the stream, there's overhanging rock cliffs with gazelles on them. The gazelles are very sure-footed, but they knock rocks down all the time, and there's always rocks coming down. You've got to watch out for the gazelles. Okay. In these caves is where King David hid from King Saul. He can go to the exact place. He can go up there. Tour groups go up there. I've been there many times. Used to go there with my wife when she was my girlfriend. <coughs> go up there. But it goes from the Dead Sea, the lowest place on the face of the earth. Dry heat. I'm not exaggerating. 120 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Israeli soldiers stationed in that area carry more weight in water than they do in bullets. And they carry a lot of bullets. My son was in the, I was only in a little bit, my son was in the Israeli army for a couple of years. And uh, a lot of it is how to survive and how to fight in that heat without dehydrating. And the sergeants, the Samalim, were always yelling, Tishtay, Tishtay, drink, 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 drink. 
rehydrate. And they take these salt tablets to prevent heat stroke. It's absolutely terrible. It's a terrible environment. Lowest place on the face of the earth is where I'm getting is. Now sheep are covered with wool. <laughs> and their epidermis secretes lanolin. And it's 120, 125 degrees. And you'll see Israeli soldiers, I'm not joking, you can see this sometimes in the morning, they're frying eggs on the hood of a jeep as if it was a skillet. And the, egg, the eggs fry on the bonnet of the jeep and as they cook the eggs. And <laughs> that's how hot it is. Now a sheep is a dumb animal. All that sheep sees is the Dead Sea, which is saline. It's two-thirds sodium and other things like potassium and so forth. If a sheep drinks that water, particularly in that heat, it's going to have lamb chops for dinner. All the sheep knows is I'm secreting lana and I'm covered with wool and that sun is beating down and I am thirsty. And they will head for that dead sea. The shepherds, you can still see better when shepherds doing this. Keep them away. But if you were to go up the green stripe, you've got another problem. When there's the most water in the brook, it's rushing water. You've got things called wadis, wadis. You've got the same thing in the American Southwest. I've seen them in like uh, uh, Mojave Desert in California. They're dried up riverbeds but they become flash flood zones. And there was a time, this is a number of years ago, two Israeli soldiers were washed away and killed. Two soldiers were washed away and killed. Very dangerous for a sheep or a lamb especially. So even though that water is clean and fresh and sweet and, and portable, drinkable, it's dangerous. The sheep are not geared to drink that way. They have to put their heads back. Very dangerous. So the shepherd's got to keep them away from the poison water and from the dangerous water. But when you get up to the top, there are two ponds, one big one, one big pond on front of the cave where David hid from Saul. And it's beautiful. There's nice plants and fauna. There's birds, there's butterflies. There's, there's no people around to scare them. And sheep go there, and you've got this calm, beautiful, sweet water surrounded by lush vegetation in the middle of this barren wasteland. This is Ein Gedi. It's Israel's most famous oasis called the Neve, but not the only one by any means. So the sheep... They just head for the water. Shepherds got to keep them away first from the Dead Sea and then from the rushing water. Then he's got to get them through this valley with the falling rock zones. That's the valley of death. <laughs> get away from there. Get away from there. Using the shepherd's crook the rod and staff to keep the sheep away from the Dead Sea where the water is poison to them and to keep them away from the rushing water. Sheep will go right for it. Just like a baby will put his finger in an electrical socket. They don't know. They know what they want. They don't know what they need. The shepherd does. Well... <clears throat> He makes me lie down in pastures. He leadeth me by water still. Don't drink it there. Don't drink that. Don't drink this. Keep away. Don't go near that. This way. Follow me. Watch out for the falling rocks. Keep your eye on. Don't go too far. 
Then he gets them up there where the waters are still. We live in a fallen world. It's dangerous. And sheep are stupid. Christians can be naive, gullible, undiscerning, ignorant. It's unbelievable. Jesus even said the unsaved are more clever in the ways of the world than Christians are. Be innocent. The sons of darkness are shrewder than the sons of light. <laughs> be innocent as a dove, but wise as a serpent. We have to be as clever as our enemy. <laughs> we're not supposed to be devious like our enemy, but we're supposed to understand his deviousness. <laughs> Christians are never called to be naive. So often this happens in Christian families. Kids grow up in a Christian family and Sunday school and church. Then they go up to university and they see what the real world is like. They're unprepared for it. And they fall away from the Lord and get into the world and all sorts of things happen because they were never shown how to survive in a hostile environment. When you're in a hostile environment, you need to walk with the Lord very closely. In my wayward youth, I was a cocaine addict. David was a junkie. We were in the world of drugs. And um, I went through an incubation period for two and a half to three years where I couldn't listen to any music except for traditional hymns and certain things. I particularly couldn't listen to classical music or rock music or blues or anything like because I associated it with drugs and with sexual immorality. I reached a point in my life and my growth, however, where I was able to walk with Jesus and I was able to go out in New York City and witness to drug addicts on the street and give them tracks. I could be right in the middle of what I was saved out of and tell them the gospel. Needed a period of growth. Couldn't have done it as a lamb, but you can do it as a sheep if you walk with the shepherd. Didn't matter to me, they were taking drugs, they, they had no temptation. The world was treacherous. So it goes. Remember, I'll give you living water, Maim Hayim, John 7, 38 and 39. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. John 4, he told the woman at the well, I will give you Maim Hayim, living water, the Holy Spirit. Comes from Isaiah 44, 3, I'll pour out my spirit. Okay. But to a sheep, water is water. You see people going looking for the Holy Spirit in wrong places. Pensacola, Florida, Toronto, Canada. Why will they go to these counterfeit revivals? All they see is the water, the spirit. Yeah, but what spirit? Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. People out of control having conniptions? No. Oh. Where's the Holy Spirit? The waters are still. That doesn't mean we don't get excited. You can, I used to jump with my wife into the pool of Angeti and splash and kick around and swim around. We had a great time. Doesn't mean it's not excited, but the waters were still. They weren't dangerous. You can't even swim in the Dead Sea. You're so buoyant. Little scratch. It will burn like the henna. <laughs> Where the Lord leads you, the waters are always still. The fruit of the Spirit is a crete, self-control, we're told twice in the New Testament. People aren't doing crazy things. Nafshi Yeshoviev Yanchini he restoreth my soul. Let me tell you what that really says. Nafshi Yeshoviev. From Teshuvah. The Hebrew word for repent. Teshuvah means to turn from sin towards God. The Greek word metanoia, repent. 
is the translation of the Hebrew teshuvah. It means you turn. Repentance is not being contrite. You may be contrite. You may have a sincere regret for having sinned or done something wrong and grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay. It may involve being contrite, but that's not what repentance is. Repentance is to turn from it. You get an alcoholic who comes home drunk, abuses his family, wakes up the next day with a hangover, sees his kids and his wife shying away from him, regrets what he did, he was sorry he did it, then he goes out and gets loaded again. Did he repent? No. Was he contrite? Yeah. He tried to cope with his guilt by going out and getting, getting loaded again. <laughs> What the shepherd does, how he restores our soul, he causes us to repent. The restoration of the soul will always come by repentance, where the water is. So, this picture a situation something like this. You got an unsaved wife or an unsaved husband and you're trying to come to church and get the kids to Sunday school to bring them up in the ways of the Lord but you you got saved after you were a Christian and your husband is still not a believer and you, or your wife maybe more likely the husband and your unsaved husband or your unsaved spouse picks a stupid fight with you a stupid argument before you go to church this is the devil attacking argue back and you feel this and you're tense and you bite back and you tell them that but. and you get to church and you walk through the door and everybody's singing hallelujah and the spirit of the Lord is moving great is thy faithfulness and emotionally you feel like you just crawled out of a gutter because in a matter of speaking you did the soul is not the spirit Soul's the mind, emotions, intellect. He restores our soul. He re How does the Lord restore us emotionally? You walk into that church and the Spirit of God is moving and people are worshiping and praising the Lord and they're going to have the Lord's Supper, whatever it is, and you feel like crud. The devil knows which buttons to push and when to push them. And walk through that door. The shepherd says, I understand. Look, you're all right, you blew it, but you know, I, I look, the guy's not saved. Look, come on in here. <laughs> come on in here. I'm sorry, Lord, I know you are. He causes our soul to turn. The way he restores us emotionally, psychologically, is by causing us to repent. In order to get someone to repent, God uses guilt. Once there is a repentance, the guilt has served its purpose. Then it's something that the devil tries to use. You understand? Pre-repentance, it's a weapon in God's arsenal. Post-repentance, it's a weapon in the devil's arsenal. To remind you of all this bad stuff you did. <laughs> Well, if God causes himself to forget our sin for the sake of his son, why are we going to let the devil remind us about it? But it's a battle of the soul. He restores our soul. I don't know how to get this, but get the eraser. He guideth me in straight paths or leadeth me in what narrow paths or something like that. That's not what it says. It says, Amagale Tzedek. Not narrow way. It's circles of righteousness. Circles of 
righteousness. This is our circle where the shepherd is. At night, the shepherds put the sheep in a circle and they use their staff to draw a, draw a circle in the sand. Israel's mostly sand if it's not swamp. <laughs> or there's the reddish clay in the soils, red, reddish clay, and draw a circle. And they watch for burrowing, burrowing serpents. And there's a fire in the middle, and the shepherd's there, warming, keeping warm, but they patrol the circle. Okay. It's a circle of righteousness. Out there is the world. When we meet together as believers, we come into the Magalit Tzedek. The Lord leads us into the circle of righteousness. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. It says in Proverbs, he who remains alone quarrels against all sound wisdom. They seek their own desire. Oh, the church is filled with hypocrites. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but the church is filled with hypocrites. In that case, you ought to fit right in. This is not a social club for nice people. It's a rehab center for forgiven sinners. <laughs> That's all. It's just where basket cases are being transformed by the power of God's spirit. We're no better than the world in and of ourselves. It's only the righteousness of Jesus. And the Magalai Tzedek. The Lord will always lead us into the Magalai Tzedek. You can't find the good church meet in a home. But let's go. He does this for his own namesake. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, particularly in Kings and Chronicles, you'll see <clears throat> when Israel went into backsliding and rebellion, God would often still give them victory over the Philistines and things like that for his own namesake. He didn't want the Philistines thinking that their god Dagon or something was a superior god to him for his own name's sake. Now that's something. The Lord does good to us for his own name's sake. Why does God forgive our sin? For the sake of his son who has his name. Sake of a son. He can't forgive us. He can't forgive us unless his son paid for what we did. Why did I die, Father, to save them? You can't let them go. I died for them. The name above all names. He does it for his own namesake. The things the Lord does for us, he does because of his own name. Well, let's look. Gamki alek begets al mavid. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, lo irara. Remember the fallen rock zone? Now, most of the Christians I know see this as some kind of a tunnel when you give up the ghost with light at the end of it or something like that, and they think that's the shadow of death. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's not what Stephen saw. The passages of Scripture that tell us what you see when you give up the ghost doesn't have him going through a tunnel. <laughs> That's not what he saw. But walking and sojourning in this life in a fallen world, that's the valley of death. This is a fallen rock zone. And you've got a rushing stream on one side that can wash you away and kill you, pushing you a tremendous aquatic force into boulders, and you got... Falling rocks. 
This place is dangerous. Not only that, there's predatory animals. Predatory animals. Adiot, lions. Well, wolves. We call them ze'avim in Hebrew. And we know that the wolf knows how to dress up like a sheep. A shadow can't hurt you. The valley of the shadow of death. A shadow can't hurt you. But it tells you that there's something nearby that can. <laughs> when you're in this world, you're in the shadow of the valley of death. Shadow of the valley. The shadow can't hurt you. But there's something nearby that can unless you stick close to the shepherd. He knows how to get you through that thing. He knows how to get us through this world. He went to the cross and he rose. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Another type of Christ is Moses. How did Moses lead Israel 40 years through the wilderness? He spent 40 years in that same wilderness himself. A shepherd, a pastor, is somebody who has spent their time in the wilderness. That's one of the reasons we cannot allow young believers to be pastors. Now, young, I don't necessarily mean biologically young. I mean newly saved. Unless you've been through the wilderness, you don't know how to lead other people through it. Unless you've been through the valley of the shadow of death, unless you've undergone trials, testings, temptations, you cannot be God's vehicle to guide his sheep through it. Remember, God does not count age biologically based on birth. He counts age by second birth. He told Jeremiah, you know, don't say I'm only a youth. He told Timothy, let no one look down on your youth. It's not about biological age. It's about not how long since you've been born. It's about how long since you've been born again. There's, there are young people who are quite astute and wrapped quite tight when they're even in their late 20s. And there's other people that they're, they've seen people in their 50s and 60s and they're in a playpen. They never grew. They don't, I don't know. Okay. When you go through the valley of the shadow of death, no, the shadow can't hurt you. But it tells you there's something that it can. Stick to the shepherd. Well, let's continue. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me as we translate it. Lo irara ki ata imadi, you are with me. Shivtaha u meshantaha hima yanachamuni. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Most scholars think the shepherd's staff or the shepherd's crook is the rod and staff are the same instrument applied in different ways. Notice it puts the rod first. Now the staff you can lean on. We all like to lean on the staff. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and sins to bear. I can just lean on the Lord. Well, that is true. But that is the staff. The staff comes second. The rod of correction comes first. You dumb sheep. I told you keep away from the water. What? What you go there for? I told you, Benny Hinn is a false prophet. What are you watching him on TV for? What? Get over there. <laughs> Nobody likes to smack the toddler's hand when he puts his fingers in the electrical socket, but it's better than having him barbecued, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. There's a fall in nature. Well, let's look. Then comes the staff. Then we can lean on them. 
But we have to understand, he will conk us over the head to keep us out of trouble. Parokh lefanav shurhan. In verse 5, something happens in the Hebrew poetry. It begins to take on a Paschal or a Passover imagery. Thou prepare a table before me in the presence of thine enemies. That's how it's translated, usually. Tarokh lefanav shurhan neged tzorarai. Sorry, cross that out, it's wrong. <laughs> That's not what it says. That's not what it means. He doesn't prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. The word enemy is oyev, our enemy oyevenu. That's not the word. It's sororai, the one who causes us trouble. You have the Yiddish word, the Hebrewized German, tzoros, trouble. Okay? But tzorot, like uh, in Jeremiah, hatekafat tzorat Yaakov, the time of Jacob's trouble. S Satan causes us trouble. What does it say in Peter? Don't be surprised, my brethren, when a fiery ordeal comes upon you, as if some mysterious thing was happening. Satan, knowing his time is short, he's like a lion trying to devour. Why is everything going wrong? How is this happening? <laughs> he's causing us trouble. That's what he does. And he's good at it. And he has a lot of experience. Oh, don't worry. His day is coming. But he's desperate because his day is coming. <laughs> the Lord sets a table for us not in the presence of our enemies, but against the one who causes us trouble. Remember, the Lord's Supper is not only a memorial of what he did do in his death and resurrection. We proclaim his death until he comes. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Separate teaching, I only mention it in passing. The Lord's Supper is a memorial meal, but it is also an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he's setting the table. Pastor, you're going to be over there. And David, you're going to be over there. Jacob, you're going to be over here. And Sandy, you're going to be over here. What are you looking at? You're not coming. You don't have an invitation. Guess where you're going. No eye hath seen or ear heard that the Lord prepared for those that love him. But Satan sees what the Lord is doing. And he knows he's not invited. It drives him nuts. So he does everything he can to make trouble. The table is set against the one who causes us trouble. Okay. <laughs> Deshanta Beshemin Roshi. My head's anointed with oil. <clears throat> now the word anointed is not there. Mishcha, Mish, Mashiach, Messiah is oil. That's not what the word is. It's like he pours it on. He pours it on. Look with me, please, to Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. The head is Aaron, you see that? Hebrews tells us the high priest is a picture of Christ. We are his body. Let's understand this. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. 
Ephesians 6, therefore shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Who are the feet of the body? Evangelists. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is sound, the body will be sound. Teachers. Well, you can have really good foot, but it's no good unless it's at the end of a leg. <laughs> you can have really good eyes, but it's no good unless it's in somebody's head. <laughs> to have the anointing, you must be attached to the body and under the head, headship of Christ. You understand? Be careful of free agents. <laughs> You must be under the head and attached to the body. Well, let's look now. My cup runneth over. Now, this is, I don't want to get into it too much, but it comes from Paschal imagery. You fill up the cups of, this is the cup of blessing, but then there's also the cup of wrath. And in the Paschal ritual, they use a saucer now, but it's called the cup. You count out the judgments that were on Egypt. Hoshek, darkness, blood, dam, frogs, fardaya. Those same judgments are recapitulated in the book of Revelation. The cup of his wrath. Two cups are being poured out. The cup of blessing is being poured out for the believers. But the cup of wrath is being poured out for those who reject Christ. It's two cups. Okay. Cup runneth over. Cup of blessing. Remember, different liquids represent the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his nature and ministry. Oil is the anointing. Okay. Water, the living living water. Okay. Spirit poured out. Okay. Uh, wine, joy. You know, the new wine, so on. Well, let's look. Ech tov v'chesed, yardifuni, kol yamei hayai. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's not really what it says. Yardifuni is a hunter pursuing its prey. The Lord pursues us in order to do good for us in a manner that is comparable to a hunter going after the hunted. I've got a little grandson I love so much, Joshua, in England. I love him so much. I'm always looking for an excuse to do something good for him. When is Purim? When is Hanukkah? When's his birthday? It's the nature of a father. It's the nature of a grandfather. God put that in us to teach about himself. We're always looking for an excuse to do something good. For grandchildren, for instance. God created that kind of love to teach about himself. He's looking to bless us. It's not goodness and mercy shall follow me. He's actively pursuing us. Quite a thing. All the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not the house of the Lord, the house of Yahweh. Yamim. Ah, see if I can explain this. Olame Olamim from age to ages. In Greek, 
Eñao Tao Eñones. That's eternity. Okay. However, Kol Yame Hai Ai. The days of our life in this world. The Orech Yamim is both. It's this life, but it's also eternity. It's Olamei Olamim and Kol Yamei Chayai. In Isaiah, Yivarechecha Hashem Mitzion, Kol Yamei Chayai, all the days, well, yeah, it is. But it's also forever and ever. The Ora Hamim. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're already dwelling in the house of the Lord. I live in England most of the time. And periodically, I have to go to get my passport renewed or something like that to the American Embassy in London. Legally, as soon as the Marines let me in, you have to go by the, the Marines, and I get into the embassy, I have legally entered the United States by international convention. Legally, I've entered the United States. The embassy is an outpost by international law of America in London, England. Okay. This fellowship... The circle of righteousness. It's an embassy of the kingdom to come in this fallen world. We have legally entered the jurisdiction of the coming kingdom. This world's not our home, but our home has an embassy here. That's the circle of righteousness. You understand? And in that circle of righteousness, we have the table, the Lord's Supper. I only mention that in passing, but it strongly relates to the imagery of the table. Now, surely goodness and mercy is going to trace after me. The order which shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Echto vehesed yordifuni kol yamei hayim all the days of my life but we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'll tell you what I do. We have worked with children in various countries. If you go on our website, you'll see the Philippines are opening a new work in India. We take care of orphans and things like that in the third world. We have Our first work was in Africa called Ebion with AIDS, AIDS children. The parents were dead of AIDS. We took care of the the babies and things. And when I go to the airport in London, Heathrow, <clears throat> I've got to deal with certain things. Well, let's see, am I going to a malaria area in Africa? i got to go to the airport clinic, maybe get some inoculations, or I've got to go to the pharmacy in the airport, get some malarium tablets because there's malaria, plasmodium, VVAX, whatever. Got to got to do the medical stuff, health stuff, right? Got to do that stuff. Let's say, oh, I got to do some work before I get on that plane. I just got an email. I got to, where's the business lounge? I got to go, go to work. Oh, well, you got, I got to buy some presents for the kids. Oh, where's the duty-free shop? I got to do the commercial stuff, the health stuff, the work stuff, the commercial stuff. Anything else? Uh, well, yeah, you got to change money. You got to get some rand. Where's the Bureau de Change? Where's the American Express? I got to buy some South African currency. I got to do the financial stuff, the commercial stuff, the health stuff, the work stuff. I got to do all that. No getting around it. But what I really like is when I've done all that, 
and I go into the departure lounge. <laughs> when I'm in that departure lounge, Cape Town, South Africa is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And they've got posters of the Cape of Good Hope and Zulu warriors with their native headdress and <laughs> costumes and things like this and wonderful animals up in the Kruger National Park with the giraffe and rhinos. And when you see these animals in their natural habitat, it's not like a zoo. It's completely different. It's spectacular. It can be dangerous, but it's spectacular. Okay. And there's a magazine rack with all kinds of brochures and magazines about South Africa. Well, all that. And then there's a smorgasbord. Butternut soup and cooked sisters and South Africa cuisine and bulfong and wines from the Cape. You get a foretaste of the food. You get a glimpse of what you're going to see, what it's going to be like. Okay. And you're there with people who are going to the same place. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember, unsaved people, the older they get, the less they have to live for. Believers, the older they get, the more they have to live for. With unsaved people, their aspirations end at the grave. For saved people, their aspirations end begin when they check out. For unsaved people, their real trouble begins at the grave. For believers, our troubles end when we give up the ghost. The older you get, the less you have to live for if you're not a Christian. The more you have to live for if you are. There's no retirement in God's economy. Oh, you're going to retire? The Lord says, let me congratulate you on your retirement. Until now, you had to go work in a secular job, put your kids through college, and pay the mortgage. I understand that. But let me congratulate you on your retirement because now you work for me full time. <laughs> you understand? You bring forth the good sap in old age like a tree, says the Proverbs. Uh, unsaved people, the less they have. Believers, the more. Well, let's look. So I'm in the departure lounge. And here's the smorgasbord with the food from South Africa and the posters of what it looks like and the animals in the Kruger and the Zulu warriors and the Cape of Good Hope and all this fantastic scenery and all the literature and magazines about where I'm going. And I'm looking forward to seeing the kids, you know, seeing my friends. And uh, I'm with other people going the same place. Now, one of two things are going to happen. There's going to be an announcement. It's going to say, Will all passengers for Cape Town please report to gate B-32? Or it's going to say, Jacob Prash, your flight is waiting. Please report to gate 32 for Cape Town. Either we're going to fly out of here one at a time or we're going to fly out all together. It doesn't matter. We're going to the same place. Amen. This is the departure lounge. Here is the literature about where we're going. We are here with other people bound for the same destination. We take the Lord's Supper. It is a foretaste of the cuisine awaiting us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Surely, goodness and mercy will chase after me. 
Let's go through it once again. A Psalm of David, the Old Testament shadow of Jesus as Good Shepherd. Yahweh is my pastor. I shall not lack anything he knows I need. His grace will always be sufficient. Where he guides, he provides. He makes me lie down in pastures no matter how hostile the environment. He'll get me to the place I need to be. He'll lead me to where the living water really flows. His spirit, not the spirit of the world, not counterfeit spirits. He restores my soul. No, he causes me to repent when I get contaminated with this place. Then I'm restored. He leads me in straight paths. No, he brings me into the circle of righteousness. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that shadow can't hurt me, but something's around that can. I better stick close to the shepherd, then I don't have to fear it. <coughs> thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I can lean on the Lord, and if I'm stupid, he's going to get me out of trouble. Bang! Get over here, you jerk. Told you not to do that. You prepare a table for me in the presence of the one who causes me trouble. By the grace of Jesus, I have an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the one who causes us trouble doesn't. You've anointed my head with oil. Now you've poured it all over me. Attached to the body under the headship of Christ, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy is going to chase after me. God, God wants to bless me more than I want to be blessed. And he wants to bless you. Now dwell in the house of the Lord. Right now in the circle of righteousness. But the flight's going to be announced. Whether I get a private jet or we all get on the same plane, we're going to the same place. Mismola David. Yehawaro ih lo exar. Benaot desha yarbitseni al maimenuchot. Yanachrini. Nafshi Yeshoviev Yanchini. Be Magale Sedek Ramaan Shmo. Yanki. Elek Pegets al Mavid. Lo irara. Ki ata imadi. Shiftaha. Umeshantaha. Hema. Yanachamuni. Taorok. Lefanai Shulchan. Neged Sorarai. The Shanta Beshemen. Roshi. Kosi. Rebaya. Ech tov vechesed yardifuni kol yame hayai. Veshavti bebet yehoa veorach yamin. I and you and we, because of Jesus our shepherd, who is God made man, will dwell in the house of God forever. God bless and thank you for listening, Pastor. Mm -hmm.